Hello everyone. Our topic is an investment you cannot miss. It's about Christian stewardship. Money is an important subject to God. 16 of Jesus' 38 parables pertain to the handling of money and possessions. In the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, an amazing one out of every 10 verses, or 288 all in all, deal directly with the subject of money and our possessions. There are more verses in the Bible addressing money and possessions than are on faith or prayer. That's because God, the God of love, wants us not only to live with Him throughout eternity, but to live happily, holy, abundant lives here on earth as well. Money, worries, and fear for future finances are constantly among the greatest concerns people report having. People worry about having enough money to pay their bills. They are concerned that they may not have enough save for a dignified retirement. What will happen to them if they have an unexpected health emergency? God never intended that you and I would have to worry about such things. In fact, even in this troubled world, He wants us to trust in Him and know that He holds the future in His hands. Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Matthew 6, 31, 32. Today, we're going to examine God's plan for our eternal security and well-being. It all started in the Garden of Eden. Planet Earth had just come from the Creator's hands in all its splendor and perfection, glorious beyond description. The stroke of the master artist greeted the eye at every turn. Magnificent sunrises were rivaled only by breathtaking sunsets. Peaceful lakes nestled between the hills, blossoming vines and gorgeous flowers of every hue delighted the senses. Songbirds filled the air with their melodious songs. Animals in the lush meadows played and roamed unafraid. How Adam and Eve must have enjoyed the perfect world God had created for them. But there was more. The God, the Lord God, planted a garden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Genesis 2 8. Just think, somewhere amid the wonder and beauty of the newborn world, God designed a garden home for Adam and Eve. Not only did God provide a beautiful place for them to live, he also explained the delightful food he had provided for them. I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. Genesis 1, 29. Adam and Eve had no bills to pay, no taxes to worry about, no locks, no keys, no vandals or burglars, no hospitals, no pharmacies. They enjoyed every perfect health, endless youth, undenying commitment to each other, and undying commitment to each other, and a boundless love for God. God wanted them to share these blessings, so He said, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 1, 28. God also knew that mankind would have had work to do, tasks that would provide a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction. He gave Adam and Eve responsibility for oversight of this beautiful world. He told them, Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over everything that moves on the earth. Genesis 1, 28. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Genesis 2, 15. While everything belongs to God, he entrusted mankind with the stewardship of the earth. According to Webster's New World Dictionary, a steward, is one who acts as a supervisor of finances and property of another. God is the owner. We are the stewards, managing God's property. The Bible says, The earth is the Lord's, and its fullness, and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Psalm 24, 1. Again, God says, For every beast of the forest is mine. And the cattle on the thousand hills, I know all the birds of the mountains, and all the wild beasts of the field are mine. Psalm 50, 10, and 11. Even our ability to work and earn money is a gift from God to us. We really don't own anything. As our Creator, God has claim on our possession 
and lives. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant which He swore to your fathers as it is this day. Deuteronomy 8, 18. When Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, God gave them specific instructions to follow. Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. This was the test of man's loyalty. It was also a reminder that God with the ultimate honor, who is the ultimate, was the ultimate honor of everything. By obeying God's commandments, they would demonstrate their love for him and acknowledge him as the owner of everything. By being faithful stewards, they would be able to live forever in a world that was a paradise. But Adam and Eve failed the one simple test God required of them. They failed to live in recognition of God's ownership of everything and instead disobeyed the one they had given them freedom, the one who had given them freedom to eat from every tree but one. They lost their innocence, their happiness, their garden home. They fell from royalty to slavery, and Satan celebrated. But centuries later, Satan's dominion would be shattered by Christ's birth into this world. The devil's plan was to deceive the divine Son of God as easily as he had deceived Adam and Eve. After Jesus had fasted 40 days, Satan took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, All these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Matthew 4, 8 and 9. Satan hoped to entice Jesus with the kingdoms of this world. He did not succeed. The things that Satan had promised to give Jesus were not his to give. Jesus would not sell out his relationship with his father for the things of this world. Though Satan tried to tempt and entice Jesus for the next three and a half years, Jesus faithfully obeyed his father's will. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, Satan was not only defeated, his fate was sealed forever. Jesus was conqueror and the devil was defeated. Everything we are and everything we have was made possible by the gift of Jesus Christ on the cross. Whether we know it or not and whether we love him or not, our very lives and everything we own are because of him. Not only is he our creator, but he is our redeemer as well. And like Adam and Eve, we are stewards of what God instructs us, instructs to us. So, what does God require of us? Thankfully, the Bible is clear about our responsibility. Moreover, 1 Corinthians 4.2, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. I want to be a faithful steward, don't you? But what is it? that we are to be stewards of. The greatest gift God has entrusted to us is itself life. The Apostle Paul declares, God who made the world and everything in it gives to all life and breath and all things. Acts 17, 24 and 25. Our life originates from God. He sustains it. Every heartbeat, every breath, breath of air, every pulse on our body is a gift of God. Paul wrote, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12, 1. A living sacrifice means unreserved commitment. A surrender to Christ and his leadership in our lives. We should seek to use our lives to bless others and to protect our health and strength as stewards of the gift of life. We are also stewards of our time. Someone said, 
time is the stuff made stuff life is made of the psalmist seemed to recognize this responsibility when he wrote so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom psalm 90 12. to waste time is to waste life itself we all have the same number of hours in a day and minutes in each hour and we will give account for the choices we've made how to use those time one of the ways we can acknowledge God's ownership of our time is by remembering the specific time He has requested us to recognize as His. The Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, has been made holy by our Maker, and we are asked to dedicate these hours for worship and refreshment. He invites us to put aside the cares of the week, the pressures of work, shopping, worldly pursuits, and remember Him as our Creator. We are also stewards of the talents that God gives us. Well, you may ask, what specific talents for which are we are responsible as God's stewards? I don't think I have any talents. The fact is, we have all talents. We all have talents. When we think of talents, we usually think of the ability to sing well, to play an instrument, to sport, to paint a picture, speak well, or write well, or organize and lead. But some talents are not so obvious. An ability to make others feel comfortable and accepted, the talent of entertainment and hospitality, the gift of listening ear, the understanding heart, these talents may be less obvious, but they are just as important. Every ability we have to bless others, we have received from God. Paul wrote, and what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Not only are we stewards of the time and talents God has given us, we are also stewards of the money we have received. In the Bible, it is clear that those whose lives were dedicated to God were also generous with the finances they received from Him. One day, Abraham's nephew Lot and his family were taken captive from their home in, so in Sodom by an enemy tribe. When the news reached Abraham, he determined to rescue Lot and the others, and he prayed for God to be with him and give success. God was with him. Lot and his family were rescued, and the treasures taken by the enemy were recovered. As Abraham approached Sodom, the king came out to meet him, urging him to keep the treasures he had recovered, and all returned the captives to their homes. But Abraham refused to take anything for himself. Melchizedek, a priest of God, brought Abraham a meal and blessed him. Then Abraham gave him a tenth, a tithe of all. Genesis 14, 20. Abraham wanted to express his appreciation for God's guidance in securing the rescue of Lot. His returning the tithe acknowledged God's ownership and blessing. 150 years later, Abraham's <clears throat> grandson expressed his gratitude to God in the same way. While fleeing from his angry mother, Jacob felt utterly alone and afraid. He desperately wanted the protection of God, but he felt so guilty for robbing the birthright from his brother Esau that he feared God had forsaken him and would not forgive him. With a great sense of remorse, Jacob confessed his wrongs to God and then wearily laid down on the ground and slept. Then he dreamt and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were descending and ascending on it. Genesis 28, 12. When Jacob awoke, he knew that God had spoken, promising guidance and protection. Deeply touched, he prayerfully promised, Of all you give me, I will give a tenth to you. Genesis 28:22. Have you ever wondered how to thank God for His incredible goodness to you? For the gifts of life, family, health, and material blessings? Do you sometimes wonder if thank you is enough? King David felt the same way when he asked, What shall I render to the Lord for all His benefits towards me? Psalm 116, 12. The Bible principle of stewardship provides a tangible way of expressing appreciation for God for all His benefits. 
the first written instruction regarding tithing or returning a tenth to the Lord is recorded in the book of Leviticus 27, 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Leviticus 27, 30. As we return the Lord's tithe, we are continually impressed with the truth that God is the creator and the source of every blessing. And how is the tithe to be used? The book of Numbers explains. Behold, I have given the children of Levi, the ministers in the service of God, all the tithe in Israel as an inheritance. In return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Numbers 18, 21. Throughout the whole Bible, we find that the tithe was always dedicated to the support of the ministry. In the New Testament, Paul says, Do you not know that those who minister the holy things of it of the things of the temple and those who serve at the altar partake of the things of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 13, and 14. Christ commended the tithing system of his day, even as he rebuked the scribes and Pharisees and for their narrow-minded approach to religion. For you pay tithe and mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the Lord, justice and mercy and faith. This you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Matthew 23, 23. Perhaps you are wondering, how could you possibly give a tenth of your income to the Lord? Many people have wondered the same thing, but all who have made their decision to trust God's guidance and wisdom have seen the blessings in their lives. Somehow, <clears throat> nine-tenths of their income stretch farther than ten-tenths of ever did. There was Maria who squeezed an honest tithe out of his, her slim paycheck. It seemed hard at first, but later she was blessed with her own business that flourished and brought financial security. Now she gives God the credit for her financial and success and delights in giving to advance the Lord's work. Or Ed, for example, who took a leap in faith by closing his business on Sabbath, the busiest day of the week, only to be rewarded by increased business on other six days of the week. These people discovered the secret to financial security. God is a promise keeper. And what these Christians discovered firsthand was that was, that was promised by God through the prophet Malachi. In Malachi 3.10, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out to you for such a blessing that there will be not enough room to receive it. Not only are these blessings promised for those who return the faithful tithe, there is also a warning given to those who do not do so. God calls it robbery. Malachi 3.8 But you say, in what have we, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. While tithe is defined as the 10% that belongs to God, offerings are given on our own free choice from which is left over. Many have discovered that there are blessings from giving offerings freely as well. Jesus said, give and it will be given you good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Luke 6, 38. What a beautiful plan God has given for financing His work on earth. He asked us to give from our hearts, never fearing for our own needs, because He can meet them and more. It's not that God needs our money, but He does need us to remember that He is the creator and owner of everything including our very lives, and He is also the one who provides for all our needs. And the mission of the church is to take the news of Jesus to the whole world should not be the need for financed by lotteries, bingo games, or raffles. God's plan is so much better than that. And the tithing 
is a fair and reasonable way to share the burden of supporting God's work. Each person's tithe is proportionate to what they have received. If you earn $1,000, you return 100 to God. If you earn 100 peso, you return 10 peso. What a fair system. As we give, we grow in love and compassion. And we have and a faithful and loving God he always gives us more than we can give him. Wow. One of Jesus' fascinating parables was about a diligent, industrious farmer who worked hard and had a tremendous crop at harvest. The harvest was so great that his barns couldn't contain it. They were already bursting and the crop wasn't in yet. What could he do? He struggled over the decision. Should he give the excess to the poor? But he thought, it's mine. Had he not been the one who planned carefully? Hadn't he been the one who had worked so hard? <laughs> he convinced himself of what to do. I will do this, Luke 12, 18 to 21. I will pull down my barns and build a greater one. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Luke 12, 18 to 21. The rich farmer did not acknowledge where his blessings came from. He did not recognize his creator or his obligations as a steward. He utterly forgot the poor, the orphans, the widows, and homeless. He thought only of himself. He had a problem that the Bible's teaching on stewardship is meant to protect us from. That is selfishness. He said, Jesus said, For where your treasure is, Matthew 6, 21, there your heart will be also. Jesus was very serious about our attitude toward our possessions. If not surrendered to Jesus, they could lead us away from God, even resulting in the loss of our eternal life. He said, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Matthew 16, 26. What a blessing the Bible's teaching is on stewardship. In a world in which our lives have become so complex and busy, the Bible urges us to remember from where our blessings, all our blessings come from. It encourages us to consider the price that was paid to redeem our lives from sin and death. It reminds us that everything we have is a gift from God. Our lives are a gift from God. Our health is a gift from God. Every breath we take is a gift from God who loves us unconditionally. The food we eat, the clothes we wear, the house we live in are all gifts from God. When we be give back to God, we are saying, Thank you, Lord, for what you have given to me. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for everything that you have given to us. We are grateful for everything. Help us to be good stewards, Lord. Help us to be faithful to what you have given and you are lending to us. Bless my viewers, Lord so that they can be faithful to you, Lord, in tithes and offering, so that they can enjoy the greater blessings you want to give to us. Remove selfishness from our hearts, Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayers and saving us from all our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.